this really quick. Y'all, if I don't ever say anything else, I just want you to see the picture. Is that fair? Can everybody see this picture? These are the Israelites. Okay, we're in this, this Torah portion. Who knows, who knows the name of the Torah portion? That's right. This is where Moses meets his father-in-law, Yitro, in Hebrew. And in chapter 19, we're going to see that the Israelites are brought by, Moses brings the Israelites to the base of Mount Sinai. They're all camping. And Moses is going to go up on that mountain, y'all. I mean, look how huge and majestic that is. It must have taken him days just to walk to it, let alone start climbing it, right? I mean, we read things in the Bible and we think, oh, it happened in five, ten minutes, maybe an hour. No. <laughs> There's a lot more time that passes, but these people are camping in the wilderness for the first time because, remember, they've been in Egypt for about 430 years, you know, so they were probably not used to this at all. So now they're in caravans, and they've got to put up these fabric tents, and they've got all these animals with them. They're trying to figure out how do we live with our families in tents and the animals outside the tents, and I'm sure all that's getting really messy and mixing up. But anyhow, we've got the Israelites here at the base of the mountain, and that mountain eventually is going to start smoking and burn like a furnace. And this is going to be the presence of God. So this is like actually my favorite Torah portion. I don't even have time to talk about it like I wanted to, but that's okay because who I feel like I've been drinking something. I don't know. I just feel so calm and peaceful with the Lord's presence. It's, it's the Holy Spirit fruit punch or something, so I love it. Uh, and I'm, everybody, have, are, have you all claimed your healing, whatever you're dealing with? What, what, whatever you're dealing with, seriously, just claim it. I am healed in the name of Yeshua. My family members are healed in the name of Yeshua. My family members are being saved into the kingdom in the name of Yeshua. And I just wanted to, uh, in the last, and this is the, um, the, the IT series that Dan wanted to teach us about just um, the spiritual strongholds that can steal our inheritance, that can shut us down, that can paralyze us. A lot of times we don't, we don't grow spiritually because we're just so bombarded with the cares of the world. And so we knew that this teaching was really important because the church has been so watered down, you all, and the church is now teaching different doctrines. Uh, do y'all ever, do y'all ever listen to uh, Charles Stanley, that pastor who's been around for how many decades? Yeah. Well, now his son is teaching that, that we don't need the Ten Commandments anymore. And and that's actually um, fact because it's been printed in several magazines and and um, he's been recorded as saying it. And I think he's okay with it actually. So he wouldn't. This is not considered any form of gossip. He's actually preaching this now that we don't need the we don't need the the first three quarters of the Bible and we don't need the Ten Commandments. So that's dangerous territory, and um, we've been in dangerous territory for a while now. So we just need to make sure that we understand whose side we're on, and how the days are growing more evil, and we have to be close to God. So the video worship and the, and the live worship we've done for the last, I don't know how long we've been doing this series. Is it five weeks, six weeks? But it's all been about the battle and, you know, you know, you know laying down fear and, and, and just really, you know, just all the cares of the world. We've been focused on that. But this video worship, I really wanted to just soak in the Lord's presence because that's where the power is. If you have no other words, if you have no other prayers, always just say, Jesus, Yeshua. He knows already. He knows what you're going through. You don't have to tell him. Now, you might have to tell the devil a few things. Like what Dan says, put the message on the, on the bottom of your shoe and do that. Like I told somebody on the phone, I, I have so many conversations, y'all, text messages, emails, phone calls all the time. And I remember telling somebody, you know what, if you had a wasp that came in your house, what would you do? You'd be getting out the broom a hammer, a can of wasp spray, that you take your shoe off, you'd be doing whatever you can do to get that wasp out of your house. It's not like it's crawling on the floor and you can just stomp it. It's flying around, it's going everywhere. And it, you know it's eventually gonna sting you sometime, somewhere, and you're gonna, that's the devil. You have to treat him the same way. Anytime something comes at you like that, don't put up with it. And don't act like you can't do something about it, because you can. He's, he's just a worm, he's a big fat loser. He's already lost, but he's going to do everything in his power to discourage us. It has nothing to do with the Torah portion, does it? Anyhow, we, so in, so in uh, Yitro is where we, we, find, we first meet Moses' father-in-law. We also know that he has two sons, and we, ha we have their names now. There's Gershom and Eleazar. Um, I don't know if I said, but we're in actually Exodus 18. It's Parashal 17, but we're in, we're in chapter 18. And so we learn about Yitro. You know, just briefly, I'm just going to throw this out there. Back in uh, chapter 17 in the previous parashah, 
we met a character we had never seen before. And I don't know if anybody knows anybody about him, anything about him, but it's interesting to note that when the Amalekites, Amalek, comes against Israel out, out in the wilderness of, out in um, Rephidim, the wilderness, when they first go out into Mount Sinai, first going towards Mount Sinai in the wilderness, they encounter the Amal Amalekites. And Moses said, hey, Joshua, gather a few select men and just you know, clean their clocks. Just do something about that problem. And we have Moses, now he's like up on the mountain with his arms up. And when, when the arms are up, Israel's winning, right? But then he starts to grow weary and they have to come help him. So who comes alongside? Aaron and Hur, H-U-R. So we don't know who this Hur is. We know there's a movie out there. It was called Ben Hur, but anyhow, it's it's just interesting little little gems like that. Um, the reason why I always want to at least acknowledge the Torah portion, even if we don't read them, and there's just little gems that you might skip over and not really ponder. So who was this Hur? But anyhow, Aaron picked him, and he came and he helped Moses. So then, moving along, I want to. Can everybody open your Bibles, or you know, whether you have a smart device, tablet, or an actual book itself, just briefly go to uh, chapter 19. Um, if you, I don't know, who read the Torah portion this week? Okay, so some of y'all haven't had to yet, but it's always good for review. That's why we do the Torah portion every year, y'all, because you can get through all of these scriptures, and then you go back and you read them again. You go, wait a minute, I didn't catch that the first time I read it, or I don't remember everything. And God knows how limited we are with our memory, so he has us read things over and over and memorize things. But in chapter 19, if you're there, we just want to start in verse 3. Um, where Moses went up to God and Adonai called him to him from the mountain. Here is what you are to say to the household of Jacob to tell the people of Israel. You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you will pay careful attention to what I say and keep my covenant, then you will be my own treasure from among all the peoples. For the earth is mine and you will be a kingdom of priests. The Hebrew word is konim. You will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. Who repeats that for us in the Brit Hadashah and the apostolic writings? Do you all remember? Peter. He said that we would also be a kingdom of priests. And this is where we first get that. When, Mo when God told Moses to tell the people, you will be a kingdom of priests for me, a nation set apart. And these are the words you are to speak to the people of Israel. So he summons the leaders of the people and presented them with all these words which Adonai had ordered him to say. And all the people answered as one, everything Adonai has, says, has said, we will do. Who here is uh, familiar with a wedding ceremony where you exchange vows? I will do. I do. Things are presented. Um, I just, if you all want to see, see this later, I brought a little example of what a wedding ketubah looks like. The Ten Commandments given, given to the people is like a ketubah. It's a wedding contract. This is God telling, telling the people, hey, this is what I'm going to do for you, and this is what I expect from you. So they're getting married. So when they're, on, when they're at the base of the mountain, they're getting ready to meet and hear from their bridegroom. We won't get into, was it God, was it Yeshua, because they're, they're the same, and that's another teaching. So then further down in verse 16, on the morning of the third day, there was thunder, lightning, and a thick cloud on the mountain. Then a shofar blasted, a blast sounded so li loudly that all the people in the camp trembled. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet God, and they stood near the base of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was enveloped in smoke, because Adonai descended onto it in fire. Its smoke went up like the smoke from a furnace, and the whole mountain shook violently. As the sound of the shofar grew louder and louder, Moshe spoke, and God answered him with a voice. Can you imagine, y'all, you went, does anybody go camping? Who, who here goes camping or has been camping as a child or as an adult? Can you imagine <laughs> seeing something like that? Of course, you know, there's 600,000 men, as we, as we discussed before, that's a workforce Amazon doesn't even have. You know, Amazon, you know, the, the online shopping mall. <laughs> they don't even have 600,000 workers, but there's 600,000 men at the base of that mountain along with women and children. So that's a lot of people. So then it's um, at this place right here that God gives his, his Ten Commandments. So I want to um, skip over to um, verse, I think it's either 15 or 18. It's at the very end of the Ten Commandments. 
where God's speaking that. And it says, all the people experienced the thunder, the lightning, the sound of the shofar, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled. Standing at a distance, they said to Moshe, you speak with us and we will listen, but don't let God speak with us or we will die. And Moshe answered the people, don't be afraid because God has come only to test you and make you fear him so that you won't commit sins. I'm just going to briefly say that when we worry, when we operate in fear, when we operate in anything that's from the dark, in the dark realm, in the dark, in the, in the dark kingdom, that's a form of sin, you all, because it's not trusting God. It's not believing him. I'm talking to myself right now because I, I struggle with that all the time. God's been dealing with me lately because I'm in a situation in my place of employment where there's a lot of people that don't operate with integrity. At least I don't think they do. There's a lot of people I feel that don't really do the right thing, and I don't think it's that hard to do the right thing. So what do I end up doing? I end up grumbling in my mind, and I start judging people, and I'm critical. And the Lord has to remind me, you need to stop that. So for me right now, that is sin. So I need to fear God. If I'm, if I'm not fearing him, I'm not hearing him, right? But if I'm listening to everything going on around me, I can judge it really quick and go, oh, this is just fill in the blanks. And then I go home discouraged, and then I end up discouraging my husband, and then it's like swirling, and then it's just, it's just not, it's not good. So we don't need to be operating in the realm of darkness, in this, in this kingdom of darkness. We are children of the light, so we must fear him so that we do not sin. All right, let's flip over to the Haftarah, which is Isaiah. I think there's two or three, actually, verses in Isaiah, but we're just going to skip to chapter 9, verses 5 through 6, so that we can really get a glimpse of a God. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah and told, told him, starting in verse 5, For a child is born to us, and a son is given to us, and dominion will rest on his shoulders, and he will be given the name, I'm going to say it in the Hebrew so you can see it in the English in your translations, Pele Yoetz El Gibor, Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Aviad Sar Shalom, Eternal Father and Prince of Peace. That's who he is, y'all. He's a wonder of a counselor. He is our mighty God. He's father of eternity, and he's prince of peace. So if you ever doubt, always turn back to Isaiah 9. And then um, I know my, I really want my husband to be able to get up here and finish his spiritual strongholds teaching. So the last thing I want you all to turn to is Ephesians. I might have a bookmark, but I think I pulled it out. So Ephesians 6. Since we are talking about spiritual warfare, I want you all to, to really get this. Now, this is elementary. You all already probably know this. But I think it's just always worth reminding each other. When you're going through, fill in the blank. When you're feeling, fill in the blank. Whatever you're feeling or going through or experiencing or struggling with, always remember Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 10. Finally, grow powerful in union with the Lord in union with his mighty strength, use all the armor and weaponry that God provides so that you will be able to stand against the deceptive tactics of the adversary. The deceptive tactics of the adversary right now, well, actually since, I guess since the Garden of Eden, it's seductive, you all, and he's an angel of light. Sometimes it can look good. It looks innocent, but it's not. Imagine whatever, whatever you're compromising in, can you do it with Yeshua? Could he sit next to you and participate with you in that activity, whatever you're doing? Can you justify it with him in the room? Would you participate with him sitting right next to you? If it, if it wasn't deceit, we, it, I mean, deception is so deceiving. It's so deceiving. I mean, there's no other word for it. I mean, any of us can be deceived. Any of us. We're not above that. And the enemy, the adversary, Satan, whatever you want to call him, he knows the scripture better than a lot of us do. He doesn't probably have to read it over and over again like I do every year. He remembers it. He's the one that tempted Yeshua in the wilderness for 40 days. So he knows it. So we have to be very, very careful. 
I mean, if you're reading a book, if you're going to a movie, if you're watching something on TV, if you're going to a certain part, what, whatever you're doing in the world, there's a lot of stuff in the world that's enticing, and we can justify it, but just weigh it out, y'all. Just weigh it out. So the deceptive tactics of the adversary. For we are not struggling against human beings, but against, okay, y'all, this is for real, right? There are things that we're battling against, and here it is. There are rulers and authorities and cosmic powers governing this darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realm. And guess what? They don't have to sleep like we do. They're always awake. Little stinkers. Little rascals are always, yeah, the wasp, the wasp can be in your house before you know it. How about scorpions? Do y'all ever get scorpions in your house? They can just show up out of the blue and you're like, where did you come from? You know? I don't even know if scorpions and wasps have to sleep, do they? They have a short life, but. So then uh, what does Paul continue to tell us? So take up every piece of war equipment God provides so that when the evil day comes, you will be able to resist. And when the battle is won, you will still be standing. Therefore, stand. And here's our armor, you all. Make sure you have this on every single day. Have the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Put on the breastplate for righteousness. I mean, put on, a right, put on righteousness for a breastplate. And that actually comes from Messiah Yeshua. He's our righteousness. And wear on your feet the readiness that comes from the good news of Shalom. Always carry the shield of trust with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. I, I literally, when I put on my armor, I like, I like act it out. I'm like, Lord, I'm putting on my shield of faith, and it's all the way around me, 360, to make sure that there's no uh, weapons coming at me. I'm, I'm, in fact, you could think of it as a, as, a, as a body bubble, if you like. So that shield of faith is going to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of, helmet of salvation, the helmet of deliverance. And I like to say that guards and protects our mind. Along with the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the living God. As you pray all times, with all kinds of prayers and requests in the spirit, vigilantly and persistently for all God's people. We pray for ourselves, we pray for others. Y'all, we've been getting a lot of prayer requests, whether via text, email, phone calls. Don't ever worry about that. Personally, I'm going to tell you, it feels overwhelming because everybody's going through something. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't, I don't know how to pray for this person. I don't have to know how to pray for you all. I just sit down and I say, Lord, so-and-so needs you, and this is what's going on. I'm just going to bring it to you right now, Father, and ask that you help them. And then, as I'm listening the Lord starts to give me the words to pray. And I don't have to feel overwhelmed. But when I'm praying for you all, then it helps me feel stronger in my own struggles, in my own problems. So never feel, share with each other. Don't worry about being transparent because we all struggle with something and n nothing anyone has done is above anything or it should never be embarrassing. I know some people hold on to, to secrets because they're like, oh, I'm the only person in the whole world that's ever done this really <laughs> you're not that special and you didn't create sin <laughs> you know you just you just end up operating it in it as a, sometimes we're just an innocent victim things just happen but anyhow just wanted to encourage you with uh, some things that th these are just the gems that I found in the Torah portion was Ephesians part of the I know Ephesians was not but I did want to encourage you since Moray Dan Moray is Hebrew for teacher he's teaching us on the spiritual battle so Anyhow, thank you so much, y'all. I love every single one of you, and I'm so glad that you're here because it's encouraging to me and Dan when we see you every week. So Shabbat Shalom. Okay. So Carol just talked about this week's Torah portion. I, I promised y'all I would give you a fudge factor for the week ahead. Next week is Mishpatim. Who knows what Mishpatim means? Mike? Statutes, judgments, judgments, statutes. So obviously next week we're getting into some of the meat and potatoes of our Torah experience. And it's in Exodus 21, 1 to 24, 18, and then Jeremiah 34, 8 to 22. And then Matthew 5, once more, 38 to 42. You got that written down? If you don't, Send me an email, 
I'll send you the slides and I'll send you the declaration. If we'll just get the calendar put together, you're right, it'll be in that calendar too. Oh, the, oh, and that, yeah, that's right. That's right, the calendar. I, see, I forget about that, the calendar. Oh, by the way, Robert, you haven't told us if you want a calendar yet or not. Robert, sorry. Robert and Carla McLaughlin are our Irish brothers and sisters that are with us regularly, for like Irish as in across the big pond, joining us from Ireland. Uh, a yeah. few months ago, we purchased the uh, calendar, uh -huh. the Way of Messiah calendar from uh, uh, Fresh, uh, Fresh Fruit. First, first, <laughs> first fruit. Yeah, First Fruits, yeah. First Fruits of Zion, and uh, all the Torah portions are in there. And also the calendar, how it's uh, like right now we are on the 20th of Shabbat. Mm -hmm. Okay, the seven eyes. This was supposed to be like a video, but I couldn't figure that out. So just pretend that this is moving and doing something. <laughs> if you want to know what it's supposed to do, go back and look at the edited version of last week's, and you'll see the opening video. That's what this is supposed to be doing. Just kind of let your imagination roll for a second, okay? So who are the seven eyes? We've been talking about this. Our baseline, folks, y'all are going to, your visitors, but you get to, this is your chance to, to catch up a little bit. We have a baseline that we've all been talking from as we've studied this series, right? God's promises are trustworthy, right? This means yes, this means no. His promises are trustworthy. We should strive to live according to kingdom principles, always. If I get hot, will you turn me down? The ites... That's who we're talking about. They stood in ancient Israel's way, and they stand in our way today. Nothing has changed. There's nothing, Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. If it was a problem for them then, it's a problem for us now, but it's, it's different because we can't pull our, well, we, that, Carol just talked about it. We can pull our sword out and fight them, but it's not a physical sword. It's a stronger sword than that because it's the Word of God. So we want Adonai to reveal those influences in our lives, even though it might be tough to handle and to dig out because it requires us to get under the surface and really figure out who we are, who we might. That part Carol was talking about, where we do those things that we don't like very much, and we per, we'd rather Deb, I'd rather pretend that I didn't do those things. But if God's going to reveal to me what I need to change, I need to acknowledge that I may do those things, in order to pull them up, and look at them, and go, I got to get rid of that. So it's a. This is not. This is not a baby food series. This is a series that requires us to do something. It requires us to shma, which is to hear and do, not just listen. We are children of Abraham by faith. Paul told us this. And if we are children of Abraham by faith, then we are heirs according to the promise. All of those promises that Ismael mentioned when he was praying over the children, being the head, not the tail, above and not beneath. First, not the last. All those things belong to us, but if, as Carol was just saying, but if you let the devil fool you into thinking that they're not yours, you will not walk in those things. Am I saying it's your fault? Yep. What more could the Prince of Peace have done? He died for us. He rose from the tomb. He lives today. What more could he have done? And at, in his Matthew discourse, at the end, what did he say? He said, you go. He didn't say he was going to go. He told us to go. Well, we're supposed to go in the power and the authority that he has given us. But if we allow the devil to tell us you're going to see it in a minute. If we allow the devil to tell us that we can't walk in that power, then we won't walk in that power. You are what you believe you are. Who 
who's holding one of these? I don't care if it's electronic or what. Hold it up for a second. Repeat after me. This is the Word of God. I am what it says I am. I can do what it says I can do. In the name of Yeshua. So if the devil starts trying to tell you, you ain't all that in a bag of chips, the king of the universe died for you. Oh, yes, you are all that in a bag of chips. So just show him the word of God. Tell him to take a hike. Okay, all right. The abundant life is ours. If it isn't, Yeshua was a liar. It's real simple. Y'all will find that I throw curveballs out and now and then because I'm just simple enough to believe that if the word of God says something, it's true. So when Yeshua said, the devil comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have that more abundantly, either that's true or we should just go to the house because none of this matters. But I know, Ismael, that's true. So the abundant life is ours and we should be walking in it. We are to be more than conquerors. David and I were talking earlier. What we need and what we pray for is what we heard in this worship video. That the fire of God would fall on this community. And if you have never experienced the rain of the Holy Spirit entering the atmosphere, you will never be the same again. And then there won't be any doubt who you are in God's army. All right, here we go. Our cornerstone scriptures, Deuteronomy 7, it's 1 through 6. We've, of course, we've been through this. God shall deliver them before you. What did we learn that the word deliver in Hebrew actually means? Reveal. So it's not like we sit back, God kicks their butt, and we, re we reap the harvest. Nope. He's going to reveal them to us, and then He tells us to go and deal with them. I like that, because I'm just an old Texan. So when I talk about dealing with something, like I said before, if you, if you go to messing with that one, I'm, you're going, I'm going to deal with you. Now, I don't have to fill in those blanks. Every man in this house knows exactly what that means when I say I'm going to deal with you. It means one way or another, we're going to throw down. And when it's over, I'm standing up, one way or another. We should be the same way when we deal with the ites. God reveals them to us. Yeshua died so that we can have the authority necessary to deal with them. And if we don't deal with them, it's not His fault. He has given us everything. Peter says, He has given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. Well, that either means everything or it don't. And if He didn't give us everything, then He didn't give us enough. Once again, the Word of God says He gave us everything. There you go, Jamie. Let's just say all. You know what the Hebrew word for all means? All. So does the Greek word. So all means all. That's about all it can mean, all right? All. He gave us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So we dealt with the Perizzites. We dealt with the Hittites. Who remembers who the Perizzites were? What was, some, what was a trait of the Perizzites? Who remembers? Remember they had the villager mindset. They were, they were, yeah, they were stagnant. They, just, they, they felt like, well, I can't go any further. Yeah, apathy. I, I, it's like a, I can't, I'll never amount to anything small-minded, okay? The Amorites were who? Come on now, don't let me down. Exactly, they had that whole attitude of I'm better than you are, I'm all that, okay? The Hittites, of course, that is the terrorist spirit. It's the spirit of suicide, period. That's what that boiled down to. And then we dealt last week with the Girgashite and the Hivite. The Girgashite was who? Greed. The Hivite was who? You sure it wasn't the other way around? Hivite was greed. 
And the Girgashite was? What's that? That's right, Fabian. Focus on the temporal. Had a problem with the unseen. Couldn't. In other words, a lack of faith. Okay? Y'all understand what we're dealing with here, how much that'll cripple you and your walk with the Master? When we ain't done yet. So this is where the Lord says, this is how, this Dan's paraphrase, this is the King James Version, but when I read the King James Version, what comes out is Dan's paraphrase. Okay? So King Jimmy would say, but thus shall you deal with them. Dan would say, this is how you're going to deal with them. To fill in the blank, clean their clock. Beat the wheels off of them. We're not playing. And you cannot play with the spiritual forces that would kill you. If you don't deal with them first, they will kill you. Because that's what Messiah said they're here to do. To kill, to steal, and to destroy. They will kill your marriage. They will steal your joy. And they will destroy your life if you will let them. Because that's what they do. Understand, please. These spiritual forces that we're talking about hate you with every fiber of their being. Because you are the crown of God's creation. Every one of you are the crown of God's creation. There's no one like you. He loves you that much. Every one of you are unique. And Yeshua died to save every one of us. And give us that abundant life. And the devil hates that. So just know, again, who we're dealing with. So that we can... Deal with him. All right, here we go. Dig in. Remember discernment? We talked about discernment from Spurgeon. It is not knowing the difference between right and wrong. It's knowing the difference between right and almost right. Knowing the difference between right and almost right. And these spirits that we're dealing with, they operate in the almost right realm. And Carol was saying, they're very subtle. They're deceptive. Their whole, gen- their whole game is to deceive you. Well, they can't deceive you if they're operating blatantly in the wrong because every one of us would look at that and go, no, that's wrong. But if they operate in the almost right, that'd be that gray area. So if we don't have the discernment of the Holy Spirit, we're not going to pick up on the almost right. All right, so here we go. Today we're dealing with the Jebusites. Now, if you were to just look at that illustration, what would you say? Huh? Accuser. What else? Come on, put your thinking cap on. Judgment. Okay? And everything that's associated with that. Accuser and judgment. Because those two words, although they sound like you have an accuser and then there's judgment, they actually tie together in the spirit realm. And I'm going to show you how. The spirit of the Jebusites, their name means thresher. And a thresher is an agricultural activity where you beat the grain out of the husk. Think that through for a second. The thresher is after us. So what are they trying to do to us? Beat the Holy Spirit out of us. Beat your salvation out of you. If they can make you think you're not who you are, then your faith will grow weak. And you'll reach a point where it's like, why bother? This And listen, I'm not... <laughs> I wasn't always standing behind a pulpit. Neither was he, and neither was he. All three of us have been at that place in our spiritual walk where it was, why do I bother? Because when you are, James said it, when you are in a position of a teacher It's not like you're out there on the pointy end of the sword. I mean, you kind of are. 
but the adversary is going to come after you quicker. Okay? And you get beat down. But here's the newsflash. Everybody from that one that's not with us yet to the oldest guy in the room, which I think, Mike, is me, is a teacher. Every one of you sit in that office. When you go out into public, you're expected to teach the Word of God. Augustine, some, way, some pronounce him Augustine, St. Augustine, St. Augustine, said that we are to preach the gospel 24 hours a day. And when necessary, Wendy, we should use words. So you're a teacher all the time. You live the gospel. In our case, we live the gospel and we also live the Torah observant life, which makes us... I've been just a little bit weirder than other folks, okay? Because <laughs> people don't understand that. All right, so let me get going. They are descendants of Ham and Canaan. That's been a theme through the whole thing. Every spirit we've studied is a descendant of Ham and Canaan, somehow or another. They are enforcers of the social castes. Y'all may know where we're going already, okay? Their name comes from a root that means to tread. They're the threshers. They tread on people. Tr that means trodden down or polluted. So not only are they threshers trying to beat our faith out of us, they are polluters of the faith that we have. Remember the almost right? If you take crystal clear water, and you put just a little bit of dirt in it. It may look pure, but it's not quite pure. You with me? So at some point, that clear water, if you drink enough of it, it'll start to have an impact on your body itself. If they can pollute your faith just a little bit, then at some point, John's going to go, this whole faith thing, this is just a joke. Because his faith got polluted somewhere back, just a little bit. But that causes doubt, causes us to give second thoughts to what we believe and who we are. The Jebusite spirit treads or stomps on other people. Now remember, this is a spirit that will keep us from walking in our abundance because it may be a spirit that we are hosting, that we have allowed to move into our life and operate in our, in our lives, in our conduct with other people. It treads or stomps on other people. It does not hesitate to put people down. Don't anybody raise your hands. But this one today is tough. Because we're looking at ourselves here. I, maybe not you, but I can tell you when I was studying this, when I was working this out, every, every bullet point that, I, that came up went, ow. Because you can go here in a heartbeat. It is a humiliator. It enjoys making people feel small. It believes that certain people are inferior. I'm going to park right here just for a minute. And I'm going to give you some transparency. Okay? There was a time in my life when I would have hated Ismael and my sister Graciela just because their lineage was from south of the border for no other reason. And I would have told you in a heartbeat, especially among Texas men, that both of them weren't worth the time of day. <sighs> Nothing worse than having a job working for Mexican. That is the Jebusite spirit. And don't think for one second that you're free 
if you have ever thought that way about anybody. Forgive me. It is the spirit of prejudice and racism. It is the spirit of prejudice and racism. The root of that racism is perverted judgment. I would have judged them without ever knowing them. That's perverted judgment. And that breeds racism. And I don't care who you are. I know what the, what the current environment is. But let's just speak truth and nothing else. That would be okay with everybody. I don't care who you are or what your background is, everybody can be racist towards somebody else. I don't care what the melanin level is in your skin, even if you don't have any melanin, like Cynthia, who's a redhead and just like <laughs> pale as she can be, okay? Everybody, racism knows no ethnic barrier at all. Because it's a spiritual thing. And the adversary hates every human in the world, which means every human in the world is capable of racist conduct toward every other human in the world. It believes that small people should just shut up and submit. My word, don't y'all get it? I'm the teacher, don't question me. Just sit there and listen. That might work in some congregations. I know better than this congregation. That dog's not going to hunt. And I know that. Because, you know, y'all are always asking questions. Which I love. Okay, but this is, this is the spirit. This is that attitude. All of these things. Here's the Jebusite Torah tie-in. Because I promised y'all that we would try to tie in the Torah on all of this. This is from the, the Apostolic Writings. Matthew 8 chapter. You all know the account about the centurion who came to Yeshua and said, My servant's weak to death. And asked Yeshua, he, and he told the master, he said, You just say the word. And Yeshua said, I'll come and heal him. And, he, and then this guy says, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come in under my roof. Just say the word and my slave will be healed. And of course, Yeshua said later, I haven't seen this kind of faith in all of Israel. Here's the point. This individual was working under a Jebusite spirit. Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come in under my roof. Who told him that? Now, I get the idea that he's talking to the Master and that all of us, when speaking to the Lord, we are unworthy to even be in his presence. I mean, I, I get that. I understand that. But here's that almost right thing, okay? He's right in the fact that he's dealing with the king of the universe, and so there is a level of unworthiness that is true. The point is, is that when we talk like this, as followers of Yeshua, we're dealing with the Jebusite spirit. If I ever let the statement come out of my mouth. I'm just, Robin, I'm just unworthy. I'm just, really? The king of the universe told me that I'm worth everything he had to offer. So why in the world would I ever say that I was unworthy about anything? Now, there's a difference between that and arrogance. And we studied the arrogant spirit. Where's my assistant teacher. She's scooted, okay? We studied the arrogant spirit. So all of these ites work in tandem. So I can, I can move from being truly biblically humble, loving my brother more than myself, considering John and Diane's problems more important than my own problems. That's biblical humility. But when I reach that point of, well, you know, I know, I just want to be humble about this. That's false humility. And that's the Jebusite spirit. Why would you even say that? 
If you're humble, just be humble. You don't need to broadcast that. Just be humble. You don't need to say you're humble. Because the minute you say you're humble, you're lying. Otherwise, why would you say it? I don't need you to pronounce that. I'll just operate and watch the way that you, the way that you live your life. The way Mike lives his life, I can, I can testify because of the interactions that we've had. That's a humble man. He didn't have to put a sign up, walk around with a sign all the time, okay? So that's the Torah tie-in. Position with the Jebusite spirit, position is paramount. There's nothing more important than their position. They're focused on position. It's all about, look, it's all about their perceived importance. Remember the almost right. It's not about their actual importance. It's about their perceived importance. If, if Wendy is the CEO of a corporation, well then she already has a position of importance. But you know that there are CEOs of corporations who don't think that people perceive them as being important enough. Now see, if my sister Wendy was in that situation, she'd still just be Wendy, just operating in that office that she's operating in. But if she was operating under the Jebusite spirit, she might be a CEO, but want that special parking place. Don't you park your car, because that's my parking place. That's a perceived importance. One down equals one up. Here's your math lesson for today. If I can put you down, I can move up. That is the essence of the Jebusite spirit. If I can put you down, then I can move up. Because it's all about perceived importance. I want you to see me as being important. And if Mike gets in my way, then that means I'm going to have to move Mike out of my way. Wait. Oh, the microphone. So that is almost right. Okay. Because you're really not moving up. You're staying in place. That uh, is correct. I, I, you may perceive that I'm moving down, but you're not moving anywhere. That is correct. That's exactly correct. You, yeah, you, but it, once again, it's all perception. In my mind, I think that I'll make myself more important by putting somebody else down. Because the Jebusite spirit's all about my perceived position of importance. Remember, Wendy is the CEO. doesn't matter if she is the CEO. If she doesn't perceive herself as being important enough, then... She can sit in the big office upstairs with all the windows in it, but if she doesn't think she's important enough, she's going to start making sure people start acting her, uh, acting toward her that will feed that perceived importance. You, you with me? You understand what I'm saying here? Okay. Keeping others down can be really, really subtle. Norris, I don't ever do that. Did you see what Mike Murphy was wearing to congregation today? What have I, what have I just done? <laughs> That's right. Well, I've, there's three spirits operating at that point. But what I've just done is I've got Norris's attention. Norris trusts me as the moray in the community. And so I tell him it's good to see him. But then, in the same breath, I'm putting somebody else down. And it's very subtle. I'm not saying Mike is no good. I'm just saying, boy, did you see how he dressed today? Well, that in itself, that subtle statement, is, is the one down, one up. I'm not moving, but in my mind, I've just puffed myself up in my eyes. Again, this is the thing we've got to remember. It doesn't matter what, how Norris thinks of me at that point. What matters is how the Jebusite spirit thinks at that point. So in the Jebusite's idea, I have just moved up 
because I have thumped somebody and kept them down. Ignoring somebody else is a way to keep somebody down. Mm -mm. You know, Andrew made me mad. I know what I'm going to do. I'm just going to ignore him from here on out. Well, who's that hurting? It's hurting my brother, but it's ultimately hurting me because my perception is that because I'm ignoring him, watch, 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 because I'm ignoring him, and he's going to go, man, why isn't Dan talking to me? Which in my mind puffs me up because he's realizing how necessary it is to talk to me. Really? Give me a break. Okay, not sharing what you know with somebody else is a type of putting people down. What? For example, knowledge is power. Francis Bacon is, is given this quote. Did you know when he made that quote, it was about sharing power by spreading knowledge. But today, that same quote has become a case of, if I've got it, and I don't give it to you, what? I've got the power. I've moved up in importance. Woo, y'all want to fix that computer thing, you're going to hit, you need to check with Dan. Because he's got some secret, some whatever that he does that will take care of all of that. Well, okay, why didn't I just let everybody know about that? Almost fell off. If your computer's not working a certain way and I know how to fix that, I should just let you know how to take care of that instead of putting you in a position where you have to contact me to fix that. The idea of knowledge being power is that everybody should have that same amount of power because they have that knowledge. That's why we're sharing the Torah with you. I could sit on everything that we have learned about Torah over the past 22 years and make you think, Whoa, man, they know a lot of stuff. And we do know a lot of stuff. But what I want to do is I want to hook a fire hose to what we've learned, all the stuff that we've learned, and I just want to give it to all y'all. Because then you become more powerful in the kingdom of God alongside everybody else. Then we link arms because, what do we know from Solomon and Ecclesiastes? Two cords are stronger than one. And a threefold cord is not easily broken. So if we're on the same page when we're praying for somebody and the devil wants to stick his <clears throat> nose in the middle of that, forget it. Because if the three of us are on the same page, he, he can't do anything about that. Okay? But if I hold all that back, if I hold back what the Lord has taught me about prayer war over the years, then the body of this community suffers because that leaves Robin at the mercy, and he has none, of the adversary. Why would I do that? Don't worry, I'm coming back to this. We ain't done with that yet. It is a type of arrogance to humiliate, make somebody feel ashamed and foolish by injuring their dignity and self-respect, especially publicly. Everybody would know if I was ignoring Andrew. Everybody would know that. Remember, in my perception, everybody would go, why is Dan ignoring Andrew? Something must have happened there. And in that perverted judgment idea, that would boost me in my own perception. It's not about whether factually it takes place. It's about what I perceive to have taken place. This is the subtlety. It's that, it's that almost right thing, okay? It's not, it's not obviously wrong, otherwise we'd know. It's in that gray area of, mm, I don't know, Jamie, maybe it's not too wrong. Because after all, he did make me mad. So, And of course, because she is... A sympathetic sister, her response is going to be, well, Dan, I 
don't, I can't believe that. Because I just, I love you, and, and of course, and the whole time she's talking about that, my, my head's getting so big it won't even fit in the kippa anymore. I have to get a wash bucket and paint it for a kippa because my head's just getting bigger all the time. And before long, if I just keep crying a river to her, she'll go, well, you should be mad at Andrew. Now I've got an ally. See how that works? It's the act of humbling someone. Remember we were talking earlier about humbling someone. Now, but hang on. Hang, just stay with me. The spirit of the Jebusite ties in with the Amorite spirit. Remember the Amorite? What does the Amorite do? Come on, come on, come on. Y'all nailed it earlier when we were doing the review. Arrogance, okay? So it ties in with the Amorite spirit, the idea of arrogance, with one exception. The Amorite spirit's all about being subtle. The Amorite spirit does that, that gossip, that self-exaltation, all that kind of stuff, okay? The Jebusite is right out in the open. It's direct and it's purposeful. Again, there's no subtlety if I'm talking to Norris and I mention that outfit Mike's got on. There's nothing subtle about that. That's right out in the open. That's talking evil about my brother, even though it's just talking about his clothes, not his person, okay? But there's a subtleness in that, even though it's direct. Because in my perception, in the perception of the Jebusite spirit, I have just humiliated him, put himself down, so that I can move up a notch. Even if it's in Norris's mindset or at least I think it's in his mindset yeah but is it is the this type of spirit type of uh, like it wants to start something yes yes it does want to start something because if I can start you and usually that what it starts it's not like a physical altercation it's like I just want to start a if I can start a rumor okay uh, uh, you know I don't even know why I don't even know why D shows up I don't have to say anything else because that starts something. Everybody starts thinking, well, why is she? When in fact, she's our matriarch. Of course she's here. She needs to be here because she's our matriarch. And we need her. And we need her. So, but yeah, it's because when I make that little statement, then I just, I did, I just started something. And once again, it's a perception in the perception of the Jebusite spirit. I have just increased my importance by questioning the validity of somebody else. The arrogance breakdown is that it is proud, obviously. It is conceited. And this is key. Understand there's a, there's a biblical pride, which is okay. See, once again, we get in, if we don't study close enough and get involved close enough, we'll have this idea that there's, that it's a sin for me to be proud of Mike Murphy's accomplishments. Well, no, of course that's not a sin. I'm glad to see that my brother has done as well as he's done, okay? That is not a sin. The whole pride issue is whenever it's all about me, Rosa, that's when it's a problem. That's when it's, it's in that arrogance bubble. It's boastful. Woo, Toby, I preached for two hours. The other day, nobody was there, <laughs> but I preached for two hours. The whole point is, is now I'm boasting to Toby about something. Who cares, really? But I'm letting you know, I'm, I'm holding my sign up. Look at me. It's a disdain for others. You know, I've already told you all how I felt at one time about my brother and sister, but I can also have disdain for you and it not be a racist issue. Let's all drive down the highway for a second, okay? Am I gonna am I getting on am I getting out there in a place I shouldn't be, Cynthia? Let's drive down the road for a second. And that person, whoever that person is, we're doing eighty to keep up with traffic, and we're approaching Dallas, and here comes that person from our rearview mirror going around us like his tail's on fire 
weaving through traffic. I don't know that individual from Adam's house, cat. But instantly, because in my mind, come on now, <laughs> in my mind, I make a statement like, I'm going to get in trouble. I make a statement like, that idiot is going to get somebody killed. Okay. When I made that statement, I exercised disdain for that person I know nothing about. Oops. It's almost right, Gretchen. It's not completely wrong. It's just almost right. And that's why I've got that one to keep me in check because she will remind me, Dan, that person may have an emergency. You don't know. They may have somebody at home that they've got to get home and get to the hospital. And she's exactly correct. Bean? I was also going to say, by saying that person's going to get someone killed, mm -hmm. you might have just cursed them. To You're exactly correct because words someone. mean things. We've learned about that. Thank you. We know he's listening. You're exactly correct. Bec <laughs> Segway. Here we go. All right. Because I am a child of the king. And my words carry power. When I make that statement, you're right, Bean. Those words are out there. Now, they're just out there. How about this one for you? Since I have put those words out there as a child of the king who, according to the king, should act like the king and speak those things that be not as though they are. You know, Paul said that. You know that's in there, right? Uh-oh. Crickets. You don't need to go home and study that. Paul did say that. That we speak those things that be not as though they are. So when I make that statement, it's out there. And picture it as being just out there... So it might not hit that person, but I've said it. Maybe somebody else comes along and, and, quote, runs into that curse. Somebody that's got their child in the back seat. Because words have power. Pretension. Where are you going? Come back. Being, being pretentious. Being... I really am glad that y'all know me, and you should be glad too. <laughs> it will turn against you. This is really, actually, I mean, this is this is the meat right here. Okay, everything else we've said is leading to right here. It will turn against you. It's all about position, and it's a spiritual issue, and it doesn't care about you. It hates you. And as a result, you are simply a means to an end. Carol and I have taught this before. I, we haven't gotten real deep in it, but we need to understand when we're dealing with spiritual forces, spiritual outlaws cannot operate in this environment. You, in order to operate in this environment, you have to be a spirit, but you also have to live in a body. Otherwise, you can't operate in this environment. Okay? You with me? So... We are a means to an end. If that Jebusite spirit can influence me just in that moment, Jamie, in that moment to make me say something, and then in that moment I have become a means to an end. It doesn't mean I'm possessed by that spirit. It doesn't mean that. It means that in that moment because I opened my big blab mouth and spoke words that have power, words that were perverted to begin with, then I become a means to an end. Because it can't do it alone. If it feels threatened by you, then you become the target. Remember everything that we said that it will do? It will humiliate people publicly. It's all about putting people down in order to pump itself up. There was the whole math lesson that we did. One down equals one up. If you are allowing the Jebusite spirit to operate in your life, and it feels like you're getting in the way, you're next. It will take all those things that we've talked about and turn those on you. Most of you all haven't heard Ivan's testimony. The, the man has first-hand knowledge of demonic issues and demonic physical manifestations, first-hand. And they all wanted to kill him. 
Every one of them. This one wants to kill you too. Make no mistake. But it's just different. And since you become the target, it will align itself with the parasite spirit. This is what I was talking about, that whole alliance thing, Robin. It will align itself with the parasite spirit to put you in your place. Remember the parasite spirit was that villager mindset, that whole uh, self-deprecation, I can never get ahead, I'm always just going to be here, I can't do anything right, that whole trap. Yeah, I'm unworthy, that whole trap, okay? This spirit will align with that spirit in order to put you back where it thinks you're supposed to be. All of this is tied together. Adonai's thought on the proud, by the way, are pretty serious. Psalm 18, you, you, Adonai, you rescue the humble, but you, he, will humiliate the proud. Yeeks. There's one to keep in mind right there. Because <laughs> I don't want my king to feel like it's necessary for him to humiliate me. Because if you're humiliated by the king, you're, you're, you're sure enough humiliated. You're at the bottom of the pile at that point. Paul dealt with the spirit of the Jebusites. Did you know that? Because it was alive and well at that point. Watch this. Subtle, remember? Almost right. Not wrong. Almost right. He's talking, of course, about Passover. People use this for, the com for communion, all that kind of stuff. That's a teaching for way down the road. I don't have time for it today. I just want you to focus on what is being said here, okay, and the attitudes. Paul's taking these people to task. He says, when you eat, each one of you goes ahead, takes their own supper, and one is hungry and another one's drunk. Do you not have houses? for eating and drinking? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who do not have anything? That is the spirit of the Jebusites. That whole idea of humiliating somebody else because they don't have what you have. And you don't have to say a word to do that. You can think that but I promise you, if you think it long enough, eventually your big blap mouth's going to say that. It's just going to happen. It perverts the word of Adonai. This is where it's going it, to, it's, it's onion skin time, y'all. The Jebusite spirit perverts the word of Adonai. The traditions of the elders were a perversion of the words of Adonai. They thought that their traditions were as important as the Torah. The church today thinks that its traditions are as important as the Bible. Jamie, we've never done it like that before. Well, you know, Mike, I know I read in the book of Acts, second chapter, all that stuff about that jibber-jabber that went on, but, you know, we don't believe that anymore. I've told you all the story about how I was with the Wesleyans and was going to be the pastor was, and went to see the regional director and we were sitting down and he mentioned to me, he said, what, what are your thoughts on the Holy Spirit? And like I've told you, I should have just shut up and stuffed that donut in my mouth instead of saying anything. But what I said instead was, I believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I believe that we can speak in other tongues and that we have a Prayer language, too. And he closed that little red book. Poof, thank you, Dan, for shopping, stopping in. Because they didn't believe that. The traditions of the elders become more important than the Word of God itself. It perverts the Word of Adonai. The Inquisition was a perversion of the Word of God. Did you know that? Because in the Inquisition, if you disagreed with the church power, it brought your death. And you didn't just die. You died for a long time. For, for one reason. Because you dared to believe what the Word of God said and went counter to what the church powers said at the time. Like, for example, we are saved by grace through faith. That cost Martin Luther his life. 
because at the time, the church was all about selling indulgences and all of that stuff, okay? Happens the same way today. The Holocaust itself was a perversion of the word of Adonai. Did you know that? So the word of God was perverted in order to try to kill off the identifiable people of God. What? It's the almost right. And the Holocaust was brought to you by a bunch of good Lutherans. Because Lutheranism was the denomin it was the church, the de facto church in Germany for many years, especially 1939 to 1945. Hitler was a devout reader of Luther's texts. Huh. The slave trade was a perversion of the word of God. Now granted, slaves were taken in Muslim nations and in Africa they were taken by other Africans and sold off. When the slave trade got into America, I don't care about any place else, just talking about us and how we dealt with it. In the South, oh sure, preachers would preach to slaves as long as they were upstairs in the heat, but they still wouldn't treat them as equal men under God. Because their perversion was, those are, ready? Those are the sons of Ham. Who were dark-skinned. But we need to bring them into the kingdom of God, but they're still the sons of Ham, and we don't, have, we don't want to have anything to do with them. That was the slave trade. Thank God everybody wasn't like that. Every preacher wasn't like that. During our revolution, there was what they called the Black Robe Regiment, which was the, the, the pastors and the teachers who dared to preach the truth of God. Those people were still alive in the 1800s also, but the bottom line is we're looking at the Jebusite spirit and how it works. It perverts God's word. The clergy layman tension. This is another one of those, put a star by this, or if you're taking notes, circle something. Okay, circle, squares, stars, arrows, all that. This one is definitely alive in the, in the body of Messiah today. The body of Messiah as a whole. Whether it's, and I'm going to just call some names, y'all just stay with me. Whether it's in the Catholic Church, where you must go to see the priest in order to make your confession. Why? Because they're clergy and you're not. Or in the Baptist Church, because I know them. I, can, I used to be was, I was one of them, so I can talk about them, where you can't be ordained unless you go to our seminary and get all of what we teach to be the case. And then, once you're done going through our deal, we'll find you worthy to become the clergy. And then you can join our club and we'll teach you the secret handshake and all that stuff. Because there's that split in many churches between the clergy, the teachers, and the laypersons or the rest of the congregation. Well, I, you know, I, I stand behind this desk every Shabbat in our case. And so y'all, if y'all need to know anything about the Bible, you just ask me. And if I think it's important, I'll tell you. Mike? Was Yeshua talking about, when he talked about the Laod uh, Nicolaitans? Yes. Conquerors of the people. Yes, yeah, exactly. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, the whole, the, 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 for the most part, the church system that we see today is the Nicolaitan system. It's a, it's, it's a pyramid scheme for, in, in many cases. Now, I, Y'all don't write me, don't send me no emails. I know, I, Carol said, I've got to stop saying write letters because nobody writes letters. What, you want me to write a letter? So don't send me an email because I'm not saying that everybody that's involved in that 
is filled with the Jebusite spirit. I'm just telling you that this spirit operates in the in the body of Messiah, not just quote the church system, but within the body of Messiah. There are some messianic organizations that if you don't know somebody that knows somebody that's a friend with somebody else that they know, you can't get in the door. There's somebody that has attended here. I'm looking forward to him coming back. Heidi, we love you. No, Emily. Emily, we love you and we love Daniel. He was effectively blocked from going into a messianic synagogue because he has tattoos. Because, you know, Torah says you can't have a tattoo. Well, it does. But what if, like Andrew, what if he got a tattoo before he knew the Lord? Why do we do that? God forgive all of us. The book of Isaiah deals with that. And that's what those people are talking about. Those, those shepherds who do not love the flock the way Messiah did. So this spirit's alive and well in, in not only the, quote, the church system, but it's alive and well in the body of Messiah as a whole. Which is why we have to keep an eye out for it. So, now what? See, we did pretty good. Excellent. And y'all, I know, they hate to see this slide come up because I'm about to meddle. Y'all don't raise your hands. Have you ever, are you judgmental at all about anything? And I'm not talking about judging sin. That's different. See, it's that almost right. We're told to judge sin. We're not told to condemn the sinner. We're told to judge the sin. If I'm doing something that's out of line, I fully expect my elders to come to me and say, Dan, you're out of line. That's a sin that you're doing right there. And call me back into line. Well, they're not judging me. They're judging the sin, and they're correcting me. That's what we're supposed to do. There's a big difference between that and being judgmental. He's gone. I can't pick on him. So I'll come back to Mike Warren. Did you see what Mike Warren was wearing this morning? Okay. Well, that's judgmental in its own right. What difference does it make? He's modest. He's covered. His face is cl looks like it's clean. I'm, he probably brushed his teeth and washed behind his ears. Y'all come on in. Instead of, you know, we're three-piece suit people here. <laughs> Sorry. Have you demonstrated prejudice before, but have never dealt with it? See, this thing can harbor. It can just sit there, and you can think, well, I don't do that. I don't, I don't do that anymore. There's a difference between not doing that anymore and being free from it. Okay? You cannot do something some habit that you had, you cannot do that, and it'll just wait because you're not free from it. Prejudice is the same way. Have you ever drawn a conclusion about somebody just because? You know, I don't like Robin. I don't know why. I just don't. What? Well, first of all, that's my sister. Second, I don't have any. There's no. I don't have any evidence about that. Deb, she cut me off in traffic. I know she doesn't like me. No, you don't. No, you don't. That's another just because issue. That's actually a judgmental issue. I don't like that individual because. Or. You're, remember we said about the Jebusite spirit will turn on you? Okay? Hang on. You thought we were done. Do you ever think that you can do X, whatever X is, fill in the blank? Doesn't matter. I left it blank it, fake it for so y'all can fill in whatever you need to put in there. Better than everyone else? Not, not some people, but everyone. Because the bottom line is if you think you can do whatever, 
better than everyone else, you're claiming to be God. Because you don't know everyone. So why would you say that? When something... Doesn't matter. When something happens, do you ever find yourself thinking that you are, or that you look like you are, stupid or foolish? I don't care what it is that happens. Do you ever find yourself putting yourself down? Man, Wendy, I know I look, I look, I know I look stupid because of that. No, you don't. You're a child of the king. You have no reason to think that you look stupid or you look foolish. That is the Jebusite spirit turning on you because you've started to become a threat. You've started to grow. You've started to move into some spiritual authority. And this thing doesn't want you to at all. Do you ever assume what others are thinking? I got that shirt. I think we probably all do. But that's the Jebusite spirit turning on you. It's the Jebusite spirit being judgmental toward you. Because you're becoming a threat. And so, like we were saying earlier, Robin, it'll join, join forces with the parasite spirit and make you think that you're some low life and not worth anything. I bet God doesn't even love me. Well, that's the Jebusite spirit right there. You're assuming what the king of the universe thinks about you. You want to know what he thinks about you? It's right here. He loves you. He loves you so much. Y'all heard me say this. Get used to it. You're going to hear it more and more. He loves you so much he would rather die than be without you. What more could he have done? Don't you dare assume that you know what the king thinks about you. Except this one thing. That he loved you so much. He loved me so much. He was willing to come himself as a man and be tortured by sinners and nailed to a tree to die for our sins. He loves us that much. And then he got out of the tomb three days later. <laughs> Stealing the keys from death, hell, and the grave forever. For us, Deb. For us. So don't you ever assume what others are thinking and don't you ever certainly assume what God is thinking unless it's to assume rightly that he loves you. You never have evidence. You never have evidence to uh, make the assumption about what somebody else thinks about you. Just because they did something at some point that didn't make much sense doesn't have anything to do with the way that they think about you. They, they may have been having a bad day. Maybe Caritza was having a bad day, and I think that she's mad at me about something. Oh, okay, once again, that's making an assumption that I don't have information for. If people are really mad at you, you'll know. There won't be any guess around that. Why? Because men's hearts are evil from the get-go. So... These are the things, if we've done any of those, I got the shirt on a couple of those. Yeah, you're, you're wearing yours. Here's what we're going to do. First of all, let me ask you, who wants to be free of this? Amen. Let's do it. Deidre, I'm going to give you a pass. But he needs to stand up. Everybody else stand up as we make this proclamation. I want you to declare your freedom. Diane, you get a pass. You can stay right there. John, you can just put your hands on her, put, put your hand on her shoulder while you're making this declaration and you're just praying over her too. Mike, you got her. All right. <laughs> Repeat after me. Abba, Abba. Strengthen, my resolve strengthen my resolve to examine myself. Give me the courage, me the courage. And, the and the boldness to throw out the enemies, out the enemies. And, reclaim my and reclaim my heritage. 
All right, here we go. I renounce and reject, I renounce and reject the spirit of the Jebusites. Abba, Abba, I have sinned, I have sinned by, pronouncing by pronouncing judgment on others without cause. On others without cause. I, have I have drawn conclusions about people, about people for, no for no reason. Adonai, Adonai you, have me you have commanded me to love others, to love others the way you love me. In allowing, the spirit, in allowing the Jebusite spirit to influence me, I have failed to do that. Please forgive me. <laughs> He's so good. <laughs> I'm serving notice today <laughs> to all the spirit realm that I'm choosing life thoughts and life words over words and thoughts of judgment. I renounce and reject any and all tendencies to think that I am better than anyone else. Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, please reveal to me, reveal to me the, foul the foul and perverted working of the Jebusite spirit, Jebusite spirit that, has my life. that has influenced my life. Through your power, Through your power I, am I am determined to walk in true shalom, walk in true shalom with, all mankind. with all mankind. I'm taking back what the devil has stolen in the name of Yeshua. Not just today, but every day. I declare my freedom from the arrogant spirit of the Jebusites now. Right now. Not tomorrow. Right now. In the name of Yeshua. Y'all give Him praise in this house because He has given us the authority to be free. Amen. And if I can get my bride to join me up here after we have a word of prayer, we'll do the priestly blessing. Adonai <laughs> Avino Milkeno, our Father and our King you're better to us than we deserve. And we know that. You have given us the authority to deal with the ites. Thank you. We bless you that the battle is yours. If we'll just stand still and see the salvation that you bring to us. We thank you for giving us the authority to use your name, Yeshua. To walk in that power that you gave us through the Holy Spirit. I thank you personally, Father, for this community. For everyone here and everyone that's on the live stream. Our brother Robert and Carla over in Ireland and everybody between there and here. For their willingness to be involved in this. Their willingness to to declare their freedom. And Father, as the moray here, I ask you to manifest the freedom they have declared in their lives before this day is out. That they will know that they are free from this foul spirit. We thank you. We magnify you because you alone are worthy of our praise. Me kamocha Adonai be'elim. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? There's none. For you are king forever. 
We bless you. We magnify you. We place these petitions before you in that precious, powerful name that is above every name. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. I had it on backwards. <laughs> Receive the blessing of Adonai. Yivarak ka Yahweh v'yishmarecha, Yair Yahweh panavalecha v'ikunecha, Yisa Yahweh panavalecha v'yasem lecha. Shalom. Now may Yahweh bless you and keep you. May He make His face shine on you and be gracious to you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing out of place. In the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, Amen. Shabbat shalom. I don't think it's Shavuot Tov yet. Not yet. So Y'all, thanks for coming. Make sure you turn around and wave with those folks that are on the live, on the stream. live stream. We appreciate all y'all. All right, so now our hospitality director will unveil the rest of the food. That <laughs> we're not going to participate in some meals.